Well, I had something prepared, but I believe I'm going in a different direction. Praise God. So, so this right here, I'm not going to throw it away. I'm just going to use it another day. That rhyme. That was cool. I'm going to use it another day. There's just something that's been really burning in my spirit for, for quite a few months now. And it's unity. It's for the people of God to be in unity. For the people of God to not just talk about it, but to demonstrate it. To be able to walk in it. And in order to walk in unity, the unity of the spirit. See, and that's just what it is. When the scripture calls it and titles it the unity of the spirit, what he's done is he has given to us the perfect title for what that unity is and who is behind it, who it is that's required to orchestrate unity. It's the unity of the spirit. It's unity among the brothers and the sisters in Christ. If you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have become born again and you have been changed, then you are who he's talking about. You're a sister. You're a brother. That's a part of that. And one of the best passages that I know of that actually speaks of unity is Psalms 133. Let's go to Psalms 133. Praise the Lord. So twice in one week I was able to go and minister in, in a correctional facility in a jailhouse and uh, you're not allowed to bring a phone in there and I've been doing Bible studies offshore and over here at the church and at my house and I've been doing it for years and I've been doing them through the Bible app on my phone and so then when you go into the jailhouse or you go into the correctional facility you're not supposed to bring your phone in there they don't want you to bring it in there so I had to adapt and adjust. And so I was telling Pastor Matt that, you know, I asked him, I said, man, was it really hard for you to, to kind of, you know, transit? He's like, it was a challenge. And so I'm trying to break myself in more and like really get myself back to holding the Bible in my hand like this, you know, and, and reading and studying from it and finding passages from it. It's really a good exercise because you just don't know what's around the corner and we might, the digital age might be knocked out. Who knows? But Psalms 133. Uh, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. With unity, there is a command of blessing where there is true unity, not surface cooperation. You understand what I'm talking about when I say that? I work on an offshore platform. Uh, it's an oil and gas shell platform, and there's a lot of surface cooperation out there. There's a lot of people passing each other through, through the hallways, sending emails back and forth in each other's inboxes, and they're cooperating with one another, but it's, it's, it's pretty evident with some that there's no heartfelt unity and togetherness in what's going on in certain respects. And so we just do what we have to do to get the job done. But the thing is, God is not okay with that That's in right. his church. He doesn't want us to just do what we got to do to get by. He doesn't want the pastor to just show up and read some online message that he found and, and downloaded and thought it was pretty good, you know, just to get by. He doesn't want me to step up here and, and do something like that either. He wants us to have a true connection with God, with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit will give to us. He'll give us a message that we can speak. And I believe that's the message tonight is unity. But what's really interesting about it, he uses two illustrations in this chapter. He talks about the high priest Aaron. He was the first high priest uh, when God gave the law to Moses. He was the first at that point going forward. And Aaron, he's describing when he was anointed with the oil. The, the oil represents the Holy Spirit, right? And so it was poured on his head. And if you notice the description here, 
It's really interesting. Look at everything that the oil touches. Look at this. He said that this unity we're talking about, he said, it's like the precious oil upon the head. Now, unlike this Aaron, he probably had hair, okay? So the oil was on his hair, on his head, right? And so then as it goes down his head, it goes down on his beard. And then from his beard, somehow it makes its way onto his robes and it goes down his robes. But notice you never see a place where it touched flesh. Not one time did it touch skin. It has nothing to do. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and the unity of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with human flesh, with carnal desire. It has everything to do with absolute total submission to God the Holy Spirit, and to allow Him to be the center. And so in America, we have uh, been programmed, I believe, from very young to be very self-centered, very egocentric. Yes. Yes. Egocentric, you know, I am the center of everything. And everything that I do, it serves me. Mm. And it's almost like a cult, the kingdom cult of self. It's whatever I have to do to make sure that I'm comfortable, to make sure that my needs are met. God forbid that I put my spouse above me the way God has commanded me to do. You know, I'm going to do what I've got to do. You know, you hear that a lot offshore. I'm going to do what I have to do. Speaking about marriage, speaking about relationships. One guy, he was talking and he was getting real sassy about it. I don't even think he's even married. He's just got a partner, a live-in partner. And he, he was like, I told her, I, she knows, you know, she knows how this works, you know. But it's, it's the way of the world. It's the spirit of this world. Yes. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Yes. It's all synonymous. The spirit of this world, the spirit of Antichrist, it, it's the same thing. It's the spirit that drives the world to be what it is and to do what it does. And God wants us to get past the selfishness. God wants us to get past the kingdom. God wants to tear down and rip down, destroy the kingdom cult of self in ourselves. God wants us to not just talk about it, to not just pray about it. It might start with prayer, but at some point, God wants to bring it down. And that's the only way that the Holy Spirit is really, that God is really going to get not just what he wants, but what he deserves. Yes. Unity. And full submission. And so when we're fully submitted to God and we're completely surrendered to his will and not our own, it looks very different from the surface cooperation. It looks very different. It's genuine. It's sincere. And so then it becomes a thing where who cares what the color of the carpet in the church is, right? Yeah. Who cares who's parking in the handicapped spot? You know, whenever I show up with somebody that, that I'm bringing, that we're supposed to have, you know, if that should happen. These kind of things become very petty, yes. very small and unimportant because God is looking past all that stuff. And I think to him, it's, it's foolishness. You know, I think to God, it's like, well, that doesn't really matter because there's souls that God wants to hear the message, that God wants to get saved. Wade had shared something with me Sunday and it was really, really good. He knows I like it because I keep talking about it. He was talking about somebody that, that, that's in ministry and had shared with him these different acronyms. I believe they're football teams, football acronyms, like LSU. And uh, he was talking about how it can be used to, to communicate three different things. LSU, Lord save us, Lord sanctify us, Lord send us. I was like, man, that is so good. That is awesome. And so, but that's really what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and what he wants to do through us. He wants to save us and then he has to clean us because if I'm totally dominated and controlled by my sinful nature and I can't live a clean and a pure and a holy life, I'll be working offshore acting like the rest of them yes. and they won't really know that I'm a Christian. And I might even say that I'm a Christian or have Bible studies out there, but they're still seeing the way I speak in the workplace and they're seeing the way that I behave and character myself in the workplace. So Lord, save me, but sanctify me. Yes. 
Because until I'm sanctified, I don't know that he really wants to send me. I mean, let's just be real and honest about it. Yes. God doesn't want to send somebody that's filthy and, and worldly. We're supposed to be different. What do we really have to offer if we can't back it up? If we can't back it up with life, with a, with a real Christian Christian walk. Amen. So I just thought that was really good about this Psalms 133, how it never, the oil never, it, if it did, he didn't say it. So I'm focusing on what the text says. The text says that it went on his head, it went down his beard, it went on his garments, but it never touched his flesh. I don't see where it touched his flesh. So in the natural, that's the picture that we see. In the spirit, I believe that's the way God wants to use us to where we truly have grown in God to where we learn how to put aside the flesh and the desires of the flesh, the sinful tendencies, the, sin, the, the sinful um, struggle, if you will. God wants us to be able to get over that and to get through that. Amen. And it's only through, because the, the oil represents, the Holy Spirit represents the anointing, the yes. anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that has the power to break the yoke of, to break the yoke of bondage. It breaks, it breaks the yoke. It breaks the yoke of slavery and the yoke of sin that's over us, that's on us. And so in direct uh, conflict, with the unity of the spirit is that kingdom cult of self. And so what God wants us to do is each and every one of us, he wants us to examine ourselves. He wants us to really look inside and see what it is that we are doing or what we have done that may be affecting the unity in this place and where we are. There's more, there's more outside of this place, right? There's more churches, there's more people. There, there's people all around the world that love the Lord, that love Him just as much as us. They're demonstrating it. And God wants us to start with where we are here and now. God wants us to be right. And so we have to be willing to let go of self, to let go of what appeals to us, what appeals to our flesh. There are certain things that appeal to me. Uh, in the church setting. And I don't always get what I want. I don't always get what I prefer. I don't. We've had conversations about things that I would prefer. <laughs> I have not always gotten what I would prefer. You know? And so I have a choice when I walk away from the conversation, whether I believe, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I could have felt like I prayed about this. And I, I just know God spoke to my heart. But is that really the bottom line? It's not. Because who is that centered around? It's around Aaron sought the Lord and Aaron prayed and, and I, you know. So we have to get over that and we have to respect the order that God has put here. The order that God's put here. And so I believe that God wants us to rally around the leadership that's here. And I believe God wants us to hold their hands up high, lift them up in prayer. Yes. Seek the Lord for them. Yes. Seek the Lord for this place. Seek the Lord for what he's doing here and now, what he's going to do in the future. And the thing is, um, when it, I had done a Bible study at, on a Sunday night over here. Uh, it was a long time ago now. It's probably been about a year ago. And uh, it, was, it was about division. You know, we were trying to expose, you know, some of the scriptures and, and, and the division that, that the enemy would like to use. And so one of the things that had happened was uh, the Apostle Paul had to go and he had to confront Peter over some hypocrisy that the Apostle, you got two Apostles, these are two men of God, Peter who was with Christ and, and spent his whole earthly ministry with Christ. And then here the Apostle Paul comes a little bit later, right? He's kind of late to the party, but he gets there. God, through the manifestation and a vision of Jesus Christ, he gives him a heavenly vision where Paul sees Jesus. He was Saul at the time. He sees Jesus and then in the process of time, he changes his name. And he completely just rocks his world. He was going in, in a wrong direction and he turns him around. And then later on, Paul just starts to, to get so much revelation in God's word and God exposes and, and helps Paul to see that Peter, he was, he was acting in hypocrisy. He wasn't willing to go and, and associate with a certain group of people. 
and, and sit down and eat with them. And, and it, was, it was just blatant hypocrisy. And the apostle Paul went to Peter and he withstood him. The Bible says he withstood him to his face. It might have been in front of a bunch of people. I mean, it could have been kind of embarrassing or humiliating. This is Peter, you know. I mean, this is one of the three that was always with Jesus when he broke away from the twelve. He took three others with him. It was James, John, and Peter, you know. And Peter, he kind of had status, you would think, right? I mean, that's kind of how it, it looks, you know, in Scripture. And Paul went to him, and he confronted him. And, and you don't see anywhere where Peter bucked against it. Right. You don't see not one piece of scripture that says that he, he argued with him or he had a confrontation or any such thing. And it's apparent, it's evident that he knew he was wrong <laughs> and he repented and he turned around and he got back, he got on the right path. And so all for the sake of truth and for the unity of the Holy Spirit. So Peter could have allowed, he could have allowed pride, he could have allowed self, he could have allowed that cult that kingdom cult of self to get in the way because, you know, who is Paul? He's, he's come late to the party, right? He, he hasn't always been an apostle where we, we were from, the, from day one. You know, we were the first 12 that were called out before there was 70 or 120. But he submitted to the truth. He submitted to the truth. And that's, that's what God wants us to do as a body, as a, as a whole. God wants us to submit ourselves to the truth of God's word. God wants us to do what's necessary for unity. I'm not talking about joining up with other faiths that are not Christian. I'm not talking about that. That's not unity. That's not, you see, that, that's where you know it's different. It's not the unity of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not leading another world religion to join in with that's us right. or for us to join in with them. That's not what we're talking about. No, none of this Chris Lam or, or any of this other emergent church you know, movement where we try to get all these different faiths to come together and we work toward one common goal. That's not the Holy Spirit. God has not called us to do that. God has called his church. God has called his people. And that's the only unity. That's the only coming together that God has ever called. So. Let's go to John chapter six. John chapter 6. And we're going to go to verse 26. It says, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. They said therefore to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who has, whom he has sent. They said therefore to him, What then do you do for a sign, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus therefore said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said therefore to him, Lord, Evermore, give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, 
that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. I myself will raise him up on the last day. And so he's speaking about us. He's speaking about the people of God, the sheep, the believers that he wants to save and that he wants to bring to the very end. Everything I was when we were in the correctional facility today, we were talking about how everything in the Old Testament was pointing forward and straining toward the cross, Jesus going to the cross. And then after Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave and he ascended into heaven, everything is now straining toward his coming when he returns and when he restores his kingdom on earth. And so there's a lot of things that have to happen. We talked about how the power uh, and the authority is in the hands of the father. Acts 1, 8 talks about that. It talks about how the father has the power, all authority, and all power is in his hand. It's in his authority. Acts 1, 7 says, uh, let's see, I'm on the wrong. There we go. See, I gotta get used to using this Bible here. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times of the epochs. The King James would say seasons, the times of the seasons, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. See, God has authority over everything. He is sovereign. He has his own sovereign will over everything that happens. And ultimately, Peter talks about how we can hasten the coming of the Lord. We can, we can speed it up. We, by doing what? By doing the work of the ministry. We can't really do the work of the ministry effectively and efficiently if we're not in unity. That's right. We can hasten his coming. So we, we've, I know I've heard it a lot, you know, presented this way that we're waiting on Jesus to return. We're waiting on Jesus to come back. But let's look at it from his perspective. What is he coming for? What, what is he wanting to see when he comes back? He wants to see a bride, right? He wants to see a pure, a, a, a spotless bride, a glorious bride. And so when he looks down at the church, does he see that? Does he see a bride that is spotless? Does he see a bride that is without blemish? A glorious bride that he would have just absolute fervor and passion to unite himself with? It's just a rhetorical question. Maybe he's waiting on us. Maybe he's waiting on us. I just, I want to flip it a little bit. Maybe he's waiting on us to get ready. To be ready, to do ready, to live ready. Let's see, Deuteronomy. Twenty nine. I'm kind of walking back some scriptures that I covered today earlier. Deuteronomy, this is along the same vein of what we were just talking about. The secret things, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So again, it's pointing back to God. It's pointing back to the Father. It's pointing back to the control and and and. Just the fact that he has all these secrets and there are certain things that he will reveal to us. There's certain things that he will open up to us if we'll seek and, and we'll study and we'll pray and we'll go after God for it. He'll begin to open things up to us. And the thing is, when he opens it up to us, he wants us to teach our children. That's why he says, and to our sons, because he wants it not to stop with us. Because if there's another generation coming and another generation after that, when we pass away, when we go on to be with the Lord, the question is, what have we passed on? What have we given to the next generation? In the same vein, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I kind of like this chapter. Matthew 24, verse 36. It's the exact same underlying principle. It's the same underlying message. Matthew 24, 36, he says... 
But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. He's the only one that knows the day or the hour when Jesus is going to come back, when he's going to return, and he's going to bring up his glorious bride. So the Father has a plan, and the Father is at the top. He is at the top. He's the head of the Godhead. And Jesus being sent down to earth in submission to his Father, everything that he did, his whole life, uh, his ministry, his going to the cross, everything was in accordance to the will of God. It was all according to that. And so Jesus had to struggle with his will. We know that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was struggling. He was praying. And he was praying, God, if it's even, Father, if it's possible that this cup could pass me, if there's any way I could get out of this, it would be great. But nevertheless, I want your will. I want your will. And he submitted himself to the will of the Father. And so we see where Jesus had that struggle. And so we are going to obviously have the same type of struggle. And so Jesus, who was sinless, Jesus being the last Adam, who was created perfect like the first Adam, but ended in a very different way, totally unlike the first Adam, he ended sinless, right? He ended completely pure and spotless. And so when he died on the cross, he took the wrath of God on himself. So everything that God is storing up, the Father is storing up vengeance. He's storing up wrath. Remember the scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. He doesn't want us to, that's why we're, we're supposed to turn the other cheek, you know, instead of going toe to toe with somebody when they, when they confront us. That's the reason, because he's storing up his vengeance. He's storing up his wrath. He's the only one who is holy. He is the only one who is worthy to repay. He's a jealous God. And he's so jealous, he doesn't want anybody taking his vengeance. He wants to be the one who's going to break open the vial. He wants to be the one that has his angels sound the trumpet. When those plagues, when those... Uh, soundings and outpourings of his wrath happen. And so we have to trust God knowing that by us not going the route of vengeance and not acting out in anger, God uses us through the love of Christ so that we can bring in more souls Praise into the God. kingdom. That's the purpose. Because when the Father says enough, when he says it's time, he's going to tell the Son and the Son is going to go. And when the sun comes, that's it. There's no stopping that. There's no, when the, when the sand's coming out of that glass that hour, there's no getting it back up in there. It's, it's over. Yeah. And it's going to be ugly. And it's going to be very, very nasty. I mean, after there's going to be seven trumpets of wrath and there's going to be seven vials or bowls of his wrath that's going to be poured out. Even after that, he's going to come on a white horse. He's going to exact more vengeance and there's going to be more fighting. And there's going to be more bloodshed. So this is something that God, it's very, this is what I've come to, to see about this. It's very personal to God. It is very personal what they did to Jesus. What they did to him on the cross was extremely personal. Yeah. And so... I, that's why I believe it's called the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 6. He calls it the wrath of the Lamb. I have a different view from some others out there. They say that his vesture dipped in blood represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. I don't see it that way. The reason I say that is because when he rose from the grave and he went and appeared to the disciples, he didn't have a, a robe dipped in blood. There was none of that. He had the scars, you know, to show that he had died on the cross. But there's a passage in Isaiah chapter 63 that talks about God, talks about his garments being bloodied from the wrath of the wine press, the wine press of his wrath, bloodying his garments. You see, it's extremely personal to God. This is like serious. They didn't just kill a man. They killed his son. Mm. They killed his only begotten son. They didn't kill him. They murdered him. They tortured him. They tied him to a whipping post. 
And they threw the whip across his back. Time and time and time and time again, they spit on him. They pulled his beard out. They ridiculed him. They made fun of him. They made light of the very robe, the, the garment that he was wearing. And they were casting lots to see who was going to take his clothes. He was treated with absolute utter disrespect. No, and so this is extremely personal to God, to God the Father. Would you stand up with me? Yeah. We're going to take communion tonight. Praise the Lord. Here, would you take my hand? Please? So i got to get back to John chapter 6. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All I, want, all, all I can say is that when, when we do this, when we do it, he says we do it in remembrance of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And I know that you know that. And so to take into account, you know, to examine your life, to examine yourself, to examine your heart, and to make sure that when you do take it, um, to take it in a worthily manner, Paul talks about that. He, ta he talks about when, when you take the elements, you know, when you eat the bread and, and drink the juice, that you should uh, examine your heart and you should make sure that you're, you're not taking it in an unworthy manner. And so I used to think that it was, well, I need to make sure I got all the sin out of my heart and I need to, and, and, and it's true, but I don't think that's the ultimate point that he was making. I think the real main point, because what he was talking about was, uh, these others that were meeting before they would take communion and they were making light of it and they were uh, getting drunk off of the wine and they were eating the meals and they, they were it was robbing the, the, the elements that they were supposed to be partaking of to do what? To remember Jesus and to remember his death and his resurrection and so in context I believe it's more about us being very serious and so, like, you know, if I drop my, my bread on the ground, you know, and, and I, you know, poke the gun, you know, laugh and whatever, that's, I think that's along the lines of unworthily. You know, treating it lightly, treating it disrespectfully. That's what I mean. And so, it's really important, it's really important that we, uh, that we keep that in mind. Amen. So John chapter 6, I was in the right place earlier and I'm going to get back around that area because John chapter 6 does a really good job. Jesus does a great job in this passage. In verse 43, he says, Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every one who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. Notice he repeats it. He keeps saying it. If anyone eats of this bread, he wants us to get a revelation. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also, which I shall give for the life of the world, is my flesh. The Jews therefore began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. 
This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. That's key right there. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. He's talking about the elements. He's talking about his flesh. He's talking about his blood. And he said, you have to eat of it. You have to partake of it. And the way that we partake of it is through faith. And so we put our faith in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did. It's through the body and the blood of Jesus that we can have healing. It's through the body and the blood of Jesus that we have salvation. Through we have deliverance. It's through that. It's through that that all these things will happen. And so we have to allow our faith to latch hold of God, latch hold of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. We have to let our faith feed on that. We have to let our faith feed on that. That is where it is. Is there something? Is there something in your body that you need healing for? Is there one of your children that needs healing? A family member? Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body. We thank you that you went to the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you paid a high price, Lord, so that we, Lord, could have healing, so that we could have salvation. And we thank you, Lord, that your body was broken and that you took the whip across your back. You took the nails that pierced your hands and your feet, the crown of thorns that pierced your, your head, the sword that pierced your side. You did it all for us, Lord, so that we could be made free and we could have liberty forever. And Lord, as we do this, Lord God, we do it in remembrance of you. And right now we lay hold on your promises. We lay hold on your, the claim, the promise that you've given us where we can claim healing for our families. We can claim healing for those who are not here. They're home sick, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray against the flu. We pray against this virus that's going around, Lord. We pray against the, the horrible effects, Lord God, that's trying to tap out people's energy, Lord God, and try to take them down and discourage them. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would cause them to rise up and to take their rightful place and walk out a healing in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Lord God, that what you did at Calvary is more than enough. It is more than enough. And all that we have to do is we have to believe. And when we believe and we anchor our faith in what you did at the cross, Lord, it makes it take effect, Lord God. If we just only will believe. Yes. And Lord God, we take this bread right now. Yes. And we remember what you did for us. Thank you. Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And we thank you for the blood. Yes. We thank you, Lord God, for what that blood represents for us, Lord God. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission oh, for sins. There is no forgiveness. There is no reconciliation. There is no <coughs> restoring us back to God. We could never, humanity could never have a relationship with a holy God. Thank you, Jesus. If it was not for the mediator, if it was not for the mediation for the reconciliation of the blood of Jesus Christ. And what you did, Lord, when you died, when you shed that blood for us. We thank you, Lord God, that you endured the cross. You despised the shame. You were ashamed of the shame. You despised it. 
You would have nothing to do with it. And they mocked you and they yelled out at you and they cried out, crucify him. Lord, you continued on, Lord. Because, Lord, for you, it was all about yes. us. For you, it was all about us. Like the pearl of great price, Lord God. Seeking a pearl of great price. Lord, it was all about us. And the thing is, for us, it's all about you. Yes. It's all about what you did for us, Lord. And we are so grateful. We are forever indebted to you, Lord. We could never, we could never repay you, Lord. You paid for our eternity with you in heaven, Lord. You paid so that we could be free, Lord. And we don't want to serve you just so that we can go to heaven. We want to serve you because you're worthy. We want to serve you because you are a good God. You are a holy God. And you are well deserving of every ounce of our dedication yes. and our commitment. Yes. And God forbid that it would happen, but if you would pick me up and drop me into hell, yeah, I would have to say amen too because I know I deserve it. But God, you're good yes. and you're merciful and you're kind. Yes. And Lord, you're, you have promised us eternity with you. Oh, and we Lord. thank you for it, thank Lord. For we thank you for the blood of Jesus thank Christ. Jesus. And right now, Lord, we want to partake of this juice yes. remembering what you did for us. Hallelujah.